welcome everyone to Greener Data Exchange, the launch of our new book, Greener Data, Volume 2, with an incredible author panel, as you see here, followed by a cocktail reception right outside and book signing. So get ready, guys. It's a two-hour celebration. And yes, today we are celebrating not just the launch of a great book, but the potential of this amazing industry of ours. The potential, if together, we pay our blessings forward, we pool our resources, we learn and grow together, and really make the most of this precious time. Because if we do so, if we rise up to become our true potential, the effect cannot just be meaningful, but monumental. We can shift mountains turn tides, move clocks backwards. All right, okay, all right. I see some non-believers out there in the audience. I get you. They're like, oh, Jamie, she's been doing a lot of yoga. All right, how about this? Let's try a quick demo. You guys, oh, guys on for a quick demo? All right, for those listening to me now, can you please take out your phones and go ahead and shine your flashlight towards me. Yeah, that's it. Right now, it's just a little light trying to break through the dark. But then slowly, as we each contribute, as we each share our little light, we collectively get stronger. We create further awareness. We learn from one another. We collaborate. We partner. We work in unison. Our light becomes strength defined, a force, a movement energy waves washing over all of us. We are singing now in unison, clear and loud. We are change. We are purposeful. We are future's hope. Thank you for your brilliance. I was a little nervous about that part, I won't lie. <laughs> I'm like, no one's going to do it. Thank you. That was wonderful. And this is it, friends. What we just did together with our iPhones, we can do with our innovative minds, capable hands working together. Because it is clear to me, if we are going to solve sustainability, it is within each of us, our lights shining bright, the amazing talent right in this room, the technologists, the leaders on this stage, the authors in this book, and the readers who are inspired all collaborating together, shining their lights from every corner of the world. Together, one industry-wide beacon, light like fire, catching. We can be the example to other industries. We can be the example to the businesses co-located inside our data centers. We can be the example to the businesses and homes riding our networks. We can be the examples to our neighbors, to our politicians, to our own families, to our children. And it all starts with us right now, right here, with vision, with strategy, with capable hands. We are, all of us, the future. Welcome to Greener Data Exchange. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okataya, CEO and founder of JSA. Who is JSA? Shine your lights, my family. JSA are those of us who have been blessed with your trust these past two decades to write your headlines, share your news, and now to offer you, with our incredible authors, this new publication, hot off the press, this Amazon bestseller, Greener Data, Volume 2, this collection of 52 authors, each contributing insight, a chapter of about 3,000 words, collectively 600 pages on how the authors as industry innovators are getting greener in their neck of the woods. We have nearly every continent covered where we share our best practices, what's worked, what hasn't, what can we do now, what can we do next. As global citizens, global technologists, as an industry, as a strong, unified light. On this stage, I have seven great authors joining me today. And by the way, there are even more authors in the audience. Anyone you see wearing a boutonniere, 
an incredible author, a group of authors who gave tirelessly of their time this past year to share their wisdom and to be part of this movement. Their words, like the first few flashlights, are what I pray will spark more education, more lights to join in as we drum up the necessary momentum to make this global shift towards sustainability. So let's get to it. Seven diverse authors on the stage, not just from diverse locations, but also representing the many layers of our industry's ecosystem, from cell towers to subsea, all the amazing data networks and data centers in between. It's in the book, also representative, right here with this incredible, diverse lineup of authors. So let's go down the line, introduce yourself and your key chapter takeaways. I'm going to begin with my, my dear friend, Jeff, all the way at the end there. Jeff? Is this on? Yeah, just hold yes. it tight. You can hear me now? All right. Uh, yeah. Hold it like closer. I just want everyone to hear you. How about now? Yes. All right. We're on board. I like it. Jeff Barber, Vice President of Sales for Bloom Energy, specializing in global data centers. What is my chapter about? My chapter is about hitting head on the fact that there are pragmatic steps we can take today to reduce carbon. No one has a magical flux capacitor that can power a data center or perfectly green hydrogen that's powering a bloom fuel cell, of course. But there are definitely pragmatic steps we can take today that won't impact your tenant, that won't impact the developer. And uh, more to come on that because I think I have some more questions on that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Robert? Yep. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Rob Bunger. I work for Schneider Electric, and I'm in R&D, uh, and I'm responsible for our um, uh, Tech Explore innovation uh, portfolio. So, you know, looking out a number of years, and um, is our chapter. Uh, you know, before I talk about what's in the chapter, I kind of reflected on where we are today as a data center industry, and we're. I believe we're living in a a, a hangover of uh, the way we design and operate data centers based upon the financial industry of the 1990s, right? If you think about all the words we use in our industry from mission critical, seven by 24, uh, fault tolerant, concurrent maintainability, and all those things, and, and it's what we've all learned to ask for as customers and what we've needed to build as providers. Now, there's a convergence of things happening right now in the data center industry. That is, uh, you know, we'll call them challenges, and I think they're opportunities, right? One is the uh, sustainability uh, goals that most companies have. Another one is what's happening with the grid uh, and the constraints that we, we see there. And, and another one is this growth of AI, high-density data centers. And those three things are actually going to help be a tipping point. Uh, to making data centers uh, a little more flexible on the grid instead of being only an energy consumer, uh, being a good citizen on the grid, helping bringing more renewables into the data center. And it's not just going to be pulling from the grid, but bringing in other energy sources uh, from uh, fuel cells to energy storage, right? And you think about what AI data centers are going to do for us, uh, and, and there's a lot of, I'd say, negative press about their impact to the uh, uh, you know, to the environment. But uh, when you look at the physical infrastructure, you know, pulling along things like liquid cooling, which is, is very sustainable from an overall energy use perspective, is great. Uh, so anyways, very, very hopeful that, that this tipping point is going to be happening very soon. Thank you. Jay? <clears throat> yeah, hi. My name is uh, Jay Lawrence. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for ACS. Uh, we are in the advanced solutions engineering business, specifically around advanced compute platforms. So in a lot of ways, if you look at our business, uh, we cut through all different lanes of the industry from a very small edge computing platform in a 5G environment all the way up to hyperscale in uh, data centers. Uh, the real mission in the chapter for uh, our business is ostensibly we need to be looking at how to make sustainable business models sustainable. Uh, it doesn't really work in the end if at the end the profit incentive gets lost. The free market in my view is the best place with the right people, with the right ideas, and most of us are well intended, even though we compete like uh, you know wrestlers when we're going after a, a bit of business. 
uh, in the end, that profit incentive will yield the best solutions for the industry. Um, specifically, we look at liquid cooling as a solution, and I talk in the chapter a lot about immersion uh, cooling. We've reached a point, ostensibly, where chip thermals have exceeded the point where you should or even can cool them with air. Um, by the next generation of GPU and even CPU technology, which has more than doubled in less than two years, uh, from a thermal perspective, fans will be the buggy whips of the data center. There's no getting around that. So while we build AI solutions at one end and we cool them at the other, I suppose you could say that uh, we are both a drug dealer and the rehab center. Um, but we do believe that there's no pulling back. AI is still in diapers, let's be honest. And in 24 months, there's going to be 20,000 different versions of what generative AI means. Uh, if we want to have a real riot in the world, take away Netflix and social media and all the fancy gizmo apps that are on your phone that used to be for phone calls, which is now a PlayStation that you carry around in your pocket. Um, it's not going away and just to kind of comment, you know, the negative press about data centers and AI, I think, is something as an industry we need to be smart about, again, going to profit incentive and, and good conduct and behavior because there are so many positives that can come out of this, whether it's in medical science, whether it's in solving other problems of how we actually generate more power. But the first point is we have to conserve before we build, and that is where we come from. Well done. Brett? Hi, I'm Brett Lindsay. I'm the CEO of Arc Data Centers. And I have to admit that I did not write the chapter. Uh, our CTO, Ken Kramer, did, so I'm here to fill in for him and tell you about what he wrote. But it was specifically around uh, direct liquid cooling and an application that we did for a large tire manufacturer that has a logo that looks like little yellow wings that might be in Akron. And for them, they put in an HPC environment so that they could run simulations for tires. So they used to send tires to every auto, every auto manufacturer across the globe, every truck manufacturer, every tractor manufacturer, and instead they built an HPC setup that allows for all of their customers to run simulations at the same time. And it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so that required the, the DLC that we put in place for them and just getting that engaged for us at our, one of our first data centers with DLC and it's something that we're actively talking about from customers and we believe that we can save somewhere between 10 to 50% of the electric usage that we would have if we didn't have it in place. Well, you clearly read the chapter, so well done. <laughs> All right, my friend Dean. Hi, um, I'm Dean Nelson, Chairman and Founder of Infrastructure Masons. We're a professional association of about 6,000 people around the world, and um, we represent $200 billion worth of infrastructure projects across 130 countries. The reason I'm saying that is that my chapter is around responsible and uh, sustainable growth of digital infrastructure. So it goes back to what was just talked about. Um, the forecast right now is we will triple the capacity globally in the next yeah. 10 years. We're already seeing the doubling of it within the next five we have to figure out how we're going to do this both economically, ecologically, and socially. So it's weaving all these together as we start to build more and more data centers and more and more communities. How do we fully integrate that is actually balanced with nature, that's actually balanced with the economic model, but also balanced with the social aspects of that local community. We have to think because what got us here won't get us there. All the challenges we're facing today around power, people, perception, and planet it's all coming to a head. So we need to figure out how we're gonna do this the right way so that we can grow past what we've done in the last 10 to 20 years. We have to do it differently. Well said. Melissa. Hi, Melissa Reale Elliott. I am with DC Blocks in content marketing. So DC Blocks, we're actually about to hit, we're approaching, this is our 10th year as an operator of tier three data centers in the Southeast. So we've been building those in edge markets, but recently have announced a number of other things. Like last year, we finished completion of the newest cable landing station on the Eastern seaboard. Today, we announced the completion of our dark fiber route from Lithia Springs, Georgia, terminating at that cable landing station. So we're building digital infrastructure like most can only dream of. I mean, it's impressive. The chapter itself focuses on our data center operations and the ways that we've built efficiency in from day one. 
from our inception, we focused on energy efficiencies in, through our designs of systems, through our operational procedures. So the chapter really dives into some of that discussion through with our engineering and ops teams. Now, I traditionally come from a power background, so I've spent about a decade in power distribution to data centers, so I always kind of geek out about the different power mix that our sites can are utilizing. So some of it goes into the generation side, and I will say, while we're using a lot of power, a lot of utilities are actually starting to convert, and they're doing the right things as they shift off of coal or other traditional methods of generating power. For example, uh, when I was in Chattanooga, where one of our first, our first data center is constructed, when I was driving through, I noticed a nuclear power plant right along the path. Okay, so, so there's one just right out my window. I could reach out and touch this facility. And when I got there, I found out there are actually two nuclear power plants that our utility there is using to generate power. And as I dug deeper into that, found, well, the rest of it is hydroelectric. Well, that's amazing. That's, that's pretty renewable already. Now, TVA, who's doing the power transmission and generation there, also covers our Huntsville facility. So all of that's already a great story. So, I, so I, the chapter goes a little bit into that and then concludes with the ways that we have hired analysts to come in and assess and substantiate all of those claims because we wanted to have somebody, a third party, unbiased, review everything that we had done from our designs, review how we were operating, and come in and give us a good diagnosis of really how we were performing against other competitors other data center operators. They looked at everything with a fine tooth comb and I'm pl very proud to say it was a gold level certification, this deep Informatech data center energy design program. Gold level, highest level of sustainability and then we're still using that to continue to improve, to build on what we learned from their research. Well said. Bill? Hi, everybody. Bill Thomas. I'm the SVP of Energy at CleanArc Data Centers. We are a relatively new entrant into the data center space. Uh, we focus exclusively on the hyperscale uh, segment of the market. And my chapter is about how one addresses the, the massive scale that's been introduced by the, the hyperscalers themselves. Um, we, we started our business plan for Clean Arc in right, you know, mid-pandemic, so 21-ish. And when we started our plan, our first prototype for our buildings was 24 megawatts of critical IT. By the time we got funded in February of 22, our prototype had become 67.2 megawatts of critical IT. And by the time we start signing leases, I'll bet you it's up to 120 or more. And so the scale is growing at an astronomical pace. That means that the power requirements is growing hugely. That means that the land requirements are growing hugely. Um, we need to be good stewards of the earth and we need to be good citizens of the communities where we operate. And so my chapter is about master planning these facilities. And when you have campuses where you will have four terawatts, four terawatt hours of consumption annually, you need to be planning for it well in advance of just rolling up and trying to put the, the, uh, the racks in the buildings. And so my, my chapter is focusing on how you do that. How do you, how do you engage with the utilities uh, responsibly and do it in a timely manner such that they can plan their transmission uh, build outs? How do you participate with communities that are going to have you know, understandable opposition to having these massive facilities uh, in their communities. Um, how do you be that good citizen and how do you provide the value that our customers, the hyperscalers, uh, want and insist on? And that includes, um, you know, incorporating a lot of clean energy into powering our facilities. And uh, we can talk more about that. Yeah, well said. And Greener Data Volume 2, by the way, Two, is just two years after volume one. So we just, we just published volume one two years ago. And many ways, particularly in terms of mainstream generative AI, the world as we know it has fundamentally changed, of course, as we've been really, we mentioned AI like five times already. So 
technology, innovation, our own capabilities, technical measurement standardizations, even our own ethical guidelines, all changing at an incredible rate right now. And I think this added a lot of additional insight, honestly pressure, to include it in the book. So my question to my authors, how does this rapid rate of change, now propelled even faster by AI, impact your current and our future work, particularly in terms of sustainability? I'm gonna go ahead and go back down the line and start with you, Bill. Yeah, well, as I, I just mentioned, um, scale is becoming the issue. And I mean, if you look at the numbers in a place where there's a lot of data centers, Northern Virginia, the consumption of those facilities from 2018 to 2022 doubled in that four-year period. You are now looking at a world where in 2022, the global investment in generative AI was $40 billion. That's gonna to grow to over $1.3 trillion over the next 10 years. That's not happening without a massive amount of capacity being installed and a massive amount of energy being consumed. So the scale of the facilities to support that is, it has to grow with it. And so that, that's, that's my mandate, that's my charge, is to grow that capacity and meet those requirements responsibly. And you know, if you think, well, you know, is generative AI really a thing? Is that gonna catch, I'm, it's like the internet, it's gonna catch on. So we have to be ready for it. Yeah, Melissa, you agree? We do have to be ready for it. And I will say the reality is that rack densities were already climbing before generative AI was a thing. So before the launch of chat GPT and the explosion of this. So what we've done and I will say high density deployments are critical across a number of our tenants and occupants from government to universities to bio and life sciences. And so we actually have some case studies of what we've done to incorporate those into our facilities. We recently expanded our Birmingham data center for, with a mixed hall design so that University of Alabama could actually deploy some of their GPU clusters alongside our other traditional retail cabinets. So right now, that's a viable option. And we have to realize that not every deployment coming is going to be high density. So we have that as an option right now. For our future designs, we are planning provisions for things like liquid cooling because we know we're going to have to get creative to balance all of what's coming in. Dean? Um, <laughs> if you look at Mark Anzi, he, he said this about eight months ago that there'll be 38 gigawatts of new capacity specifically for generative AI, and he's not wrong. Uh, we interviewed over 500 of our members around the world in 50 different countries, and the things that came out, of course, were power, people, perception, and planet. Power being the number one issue because we're out. And if you look at all the markets right now, we're at an all-time low when it comes to vacancy less than 6%, less than 3%, 0% in certain areas. You look at the Silicon Valley, you look at, at Northern Virginia, et cetera. So this um, demand is very, very real. And you know that because I've been in this industry 35 years and everybody's talked about this wave. Here it comes, another one, boom, boom, boom. I, I did liquid cooling and 50 kilowatt density racks 10 years ago. But that was for a very specific workload for eBay to do search. It wasn't for everybody. They didn't need all of it. Now. That, that growth that was relatively flat literally has started to curve up. And so I know this because some of the biggest portfolios in the world, I had one-on-one -on -one conversations with those owners, and one of them told me that what they built in the last 14 years, they're doubling in the next two. Mm. These are the biggest portfolios in the world. And if you look at the acquisitions that are going on, the amount of money that's rolled in, it is absolutely real. Everybody on this stage is seeing that demand coming back in. They're filling up all the data centers. So our issue right now is we have net zero goals. The biggest companies in the world, the most influential and the most funded companies in the world are going after net zero carbon. All of a sudden they are tripling, which means that we have a risk of growth at all costs. That means compromises. Those compromises can lead to us actually exacerbating the problem we were already having a challenge with. So I think the reality is this, and I think from Bloom and a couple others who are saying here, the carbon's gonna go up before it goes down. We are at a rapid pace. We must have carbon accounting that is holistic across core and shell, equipment and power, so that we can now see it 
and uh, double down on the investments to say, how do we do carbon sequestration, additional generation of power, whatever it is, so that we can pay that debt down as fast as possible. Because if whatever you can measure, you can actually change. Right. This is what keeps me up at night right now. Those compromises are impacting all of us. And it's because business cannot overshadow what we're trying to do within the planet. We have to figure out the economic and the ecological balance as we grow. Well said. All right, Brett, tough fact to follow, my friend. Yeah, so I think one of the issues is when you think about the enterprise and what does the enterprise have expectations around AI, they're still trying to figure out what the hell it means to them. Like, what are they going to do with it? How are they going to use it? I think the challenge is that you need the enterprise to be using AI in a meaningful way so that all of this investment is starting to actually generate income for large enterprise customers. Those enterprise customers can't go into a hyperscale and put private spaces in there. They, they're, they're not wanted there. And so I think you have to have a significant investment in edge data centers across the entire country that will allow for those enterprise customers to utilize AI in a meaningful way. They don't have the power, the cool the know-how to deliver what's required to do that. And I think they're also going to be looking to people like us to be able to provide them that ESG comfort around the fact that we are going to be worried about the sustainability for them and they're going to have an expectation that we are and it's going to start to be built into contracts and pricing and the way that we think about it, which is going to be a shift from what we've done it in the past. Well said. All right, Jay. <clears throat> yeah, so I think as we step back for a second and look at this from a kind of a top-down level. I mean, AI in, at the end is, it's, like I said, it's here, it's coming, it, it's going, it's growing, it's splitting, it's dividing, it's going to keep going. But we take a view that says you have to look at what's driving the use. And if you take the telecom network through 5G and soon to be 6G, we're going to have more and more disaggregation, meaning everything moves more and more to the edge. Uh, you've got the latency requirement, the availability requirement, the power savings requirement, the bandwidth requirements. Um, you know, in, in, in 5G, it calls for a five nines availability for a system, which for those of you who aren't really big into five nines, I can tell you there's two things in the world that are five nines, which is death and taxes. Um, but as a practical matter, the availability for these systems is going to continue to go up. That's going to push higher levels of compute towards the edge. When you get towards the edge, we're talking about some of these data center situations. Well, there's a new data center moniker in 5G that new data center is going to be housing 5G workloads. That new data center could be a shed that looks like something that's in your backyard with rakes and shovels in it. And therefore, does it have the nice climate control of your 300,000 square foot Equinex or digital reality facility? And the answer is no. But it's closer to stranded power that we can repurpose and use when, say, a strip mall goes down or goes out of business. So there's a net migration of people in this country today. And I'm not talking about the border. I'm just talking about people leaving California for Texas and people leaving Texas for Oklahoma and people going from Michigan to Ohio, uh, not for football games, but just, you know, for, you know, that's a, that's a natural part of life. And AI is enabling that. So you've got a, a disaggregation of a telecom system that's driving and enabling this whole onset of AI. It's going to let us use power more efficiently throughout the entire grid, but I think the key word is more efficiently. Um, you know, with liquid cooling, which is something we evangelize and talk a lot about, um, you know, it's 40% power savings. It's a big deal. I mean, if you think about just what that means in terms of extending, and a great example in real world is a typical cell tower today only has about 5,000 watts. So we build servers that are 10,000 watts right now. We're not even pushing the envelope. That's one box that could do software-defined radios that would have AI applications for things like inferencing at the edge. But you can't turn them on if you're using all 10,000 watts because you're blowing fans to cool high-performance chips. So I think it's that integration of ecosystem and the bigger view. But as we look at the AI enabling, uh, I see that uh, just really accelerating but also dividing as we move forward. Rob? So uh, with regards to the, the rate of change uh, that's going to be happening, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with Dean uh, with regards to what the industry has to do over the next few years and achieving the sustainability goals are going to be a big challenge. Uh, uh, but I think improvements are going to be made. And on the topic of AI, I always like to address that two ways. One, uh, AI uh, applied to a data center facility, what can that do? And then a data center facility which supports AI. So in the first case, uh, you know, AI is basically, uh, if you think about applying that to a data center facility, machine learning and, and models predict trends that us mortal humans cannot predict, right? 
So everything from, uh, you know, in our case, battery wear models, uh, understanding predictive maintenance, extending the life of things, right? This is all stuff that we're going to be able to do by applying AA models to the equipment, the facility, which is going to extend the life, reduce service calls and all that, all great sustainable stuff. Now, on the flip side, an AI data center, uh, I said a couple of things already. So, so liquid cooling is going to be uh, kind of the next probably largest efficiency gain the industry is able to do at the facility level uh, that we've had in a long time. Right now, facilities are actually super efficient. You know, you're getting PUEs of 1.1 or less. I mean, you know, you just remove the fans from the IT equipment and depending on the type of server, you're saving minimum five up to 15 to 20 percent energy straight off the bat without doing anything to the facility. If you apply then the higher temperatures to the facility, it's even more and you get to these 40 percents that might not seem real, but it is actually possible. And then there are, and, and I'm kind of focusing on AI training data centers and specifically a little bit different from inference, uh, you know, what kind of redundancy do you need, right? There are d data centers being uh, built with like no redundancy, single feed. Um, if it turns off, that's okay. Turn it back on. It have set points, and they can restart the training. Now, extend that out to how you need a data center to start interacting with the grid, um, and to be a little bit more adaptive to the needs of the community that you're living in on that grid. Uh, you know. On the facility side, you could have energy storage, which is able to be a little more flexible to support the grid. On the IT side, especially with an AI data, uh, training data center, maybe you can be flexible on when you run those loads. So there's a, there's a lot of possibilities, I, I think, as we look to uh, AI in the coming years. Well said. Jeff? I got nothing. <laughs> I mean, you put me at the end of this panel with <laughs> all of these guys. So I'm just going to steal from everyone, if you don't mind, if that's all right. Yeah. No, um, I'm. I like what Dean said, carbon is going to go up before it goes down. So let's be pragmatic about how we address that. Yeah. Um, again, natural gas is responsible for the most CO2 reduction in our atmosphere out of any other method. Moving buses and cars and different things to natural gas is a massive reduction. Um, but that's not where I'm going to go because my true background is I'm an HPC nerd, big time, right? So. Um, we have one world today, which is the learning world, let's say with AI. We're going to move towards inference, and that's going to be a completely different type of world. Uh, more towards the edge. I'm not going to define the edge because it's impossible. Um, I believe that it, we're going to have to rethink the way we do everything. I especially like the comment, again, I'm just going to summarize what everyone said and steal from them. Um, <laughs> I especially like the, you know, the comment that when we're learning, when the, when the, when the machine is learning, uh, I don't necessarily need, you know, a, a tier three N plus one data center with low latency, right? right? If, I lose, if, I'm, if I'm chugging through a library and I lose that data, so I lose 15 minutes. It's not like a mission critical SAP transaction where I just lost a billion dollars, right. right? So we need to rethink that. And I, I put that many times squarely on the tenants and even the developers who aren't understanding. As we move towards inference and we begin, we continue the disaggregation of data, there is going to have to be some gains in efficiency. I think about things like an Intel chip 15 years ago before VMware, for instance, was at 15% utilization. You virtualize it, you get that up past the 80s. I think there will be products, there will be appliances that accelerate the inference model. We're using general CPUs today for inference, which is a sledgehammer and a thumbtack, <laughs> right? There's no need for that. That's a massive waste of power. So you get to a more targeted way of, of, of feeding that machine. I say it will have to go that way because what we're seeing today with GPUs is, is beyond even Moore's law, right? Which it's not, it's doubling faster than, than Moore's law did, right? So there, there is not I'd love to say the power solution is bloom, quote unquote. I would love to tell you that, but I just can't throw electrons at a building without the cooling, mm -hmm. to your guys' point and everything else. So uh, I think it will be, there'll be some quantum leaps in how we feed these engines and how we treat these engines. You know, just an end data center as an example is probably just fine for a learning model. And yeah. I hope I did an okay job of stealing everyone's ideas all the way down the line. It was a right? great wrap up. All right, thank you. <laughs> 
No, great job. All right, so given this rapid rate of change, where do you guys see the next two years heading in terms of our digital infrastructure industry and sustainability, idealistically, in reality, or perhaps what needs to happen in these next two years, in your opinion? Jay? Uh, yeah, I'll just start. The, the edge is in a galaxy far, far away. Um, it's the best place to look for it. Um, I think um, is if I look two years into the future, it's it's you know anyone's guess at the end of the day. But I think the the disaggregation comment I made before, and everything moving to that edge, which is closer to the consumer, and to deal with all these variants of AI. Remember, it's going to fracture. Uh, we're going to have 6G come, and that's going to also cause another thing to happen, which hasn't yet, which is the power grid's going to have to also disaggregate to keep up with the distribution of cores. Uh, to the uh, to the edge to get closer to the to the user, um, you know I said this a thousand times to folks when I talk to them. You know, go try to buy an air cooled car today. Uh, you're going to strike out at every lot. There, are, you know, computers are just catching up, and it is. You're right. It is the most impactful thing we can do while we're figuring out what the next really cool gizmo is that's going to generate more electrons for power efficiently and clean. We've got to figure out how to get more out of what we have. So. I see a big upswing in green and beige field deployments um, closer and closer to the consumer. That entire footprint of workloads and applications being more representative of what's there. And you guys can all think about this. Folks are doing different things in San Jose than they are in Cleveland. Not that there's anything good or bad about either, but uh, there's different technologies, different industries. Uh, we could argue football teams later, but the, uh, as a practical matter, you have this variant, and, and AI, is, as it learns to think like a person does, it's going to apply itself to doing things that people would otherwise want to do. So we're going to see a whole lot of innovation come out of that, but I do think we're going to see a lot of disaggregation in power, new power systems getting invented. Hopefully AI will help us solve some of that problem as well. It could also be a self-fulfilling benefit. but. Ideologically, I'm not really aligned to anything other than outcomes, and I do think that uh, one of the key things, and this is what you know, I try to hit on in the book, our industry today can do more to help with carbon, and I do, Dean, you are correct, it's gonna go up before it comes down, that's true with almost anything. But as a practical matter, we can do more right now uh, with things that are deployable today, next year, and the year after that, and then optimize those, and again, liquid is one of them for cooling. Yeah. Uh, but as you distribute networks and you get into greener fields, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for us to do things smarter. So that's how I look at the next 24 months. Uh, what the application space looks like in 24 months is anybody's guess. Well said. Coming back towards me. So, Brett, you're in the hot seat. So maybe a little bit of a provocative idea, but what I believe is going to happen is we're going to start to see the utility operators going private, and you're going to see them potentially being acquired and or vastly invested in by the seven people that are out there. Uh, because I don't think that there's, there's not a way for the public markets to put enough money into those utilities at the rate that's required to get where we need to be. So I think that's gonna be something that has to happen. I think you're also going to see more JVs between people who have large plots of land with boatloads of power. And so in Ohio, for example, there's old Ford stamping plants, there's large steel mills that have boatloads of water, boatloads of power and land. And I think those people are looking at it like, I have an asset that I can't give away five years ago, and now everybody wants it, and I could use a way to juice my own earnings as well. And so I think we're just gonna see more creative answers to how do you solve the problem than we have before. Interesting. Dean? So I'm going to just touch on two quick things. Yeah. Um, who here has used ChatGPT? Okay, almost 100%. This is the point. It's here already, and that's only one iteration of uh, generative AI. Um, did anybody see the GPT-4 O with the lowercase O? Yeah. Okay. Turbo. So basically digital assistance. That was from OpenAI. They're now putting cameras in your earbuds. <laughs> And you're going to be able to have visuals that now feed, and you'll have an executive assistant that's actually able to be smarter than anything out there rapidly. It, it's incredible. So there's an application of that. The day after that, Google did their right digital assistant. Next week is Apple. Like it's it's 
weaving into everything. So that when we talk about this growth, it's, it's not just about it's coming, it's here, it's all over the place. You do a Google search, GPT is actually literally creating the information on that. It's not just about a mapping of data, it's literally creating, generating content for you. So that, that's one. Um, so I, I wanna go back to a couple of things, I'll steal what, uh, what he was saying. We, we have to think differently in this. And, and I think that what's gonna change is that what got us here won't get us there. So we, we created this state of the industry report and one big trend that came out of it, a potential solution that can solve these things is called clean energy zones. Yes. The concept here is that a clean energy zone is a town or city sized master plan development concentrated around clean energy that is serving multiple industries including multi-tenant data centers. Well, you just outlined, where are those assets? Where's the power? Where's the things we can actually now master plan? Things from 100 megawatts to 10 gigawatts. We have to think about these things in that manner. Like, we, we keep organically growing in areas and trying to force these things in. Virginia is an example, the Silicon Valley. We have to now look at how would we develop these master plan industrial parks that can now optimize? Because that's the only way, first off, we can be able to scale. Secondly, we can address the sustainability parts and keep the cost under control and literally feed the demand that's coming in at a rapider pace than we've ever seen in human history. Clean energy zones. It's part of his chapter. It's a must read. Must read. Blew my mind. So glad it's in the book. Thank you. Melissa. Okay. You both have given me so much to think about now. So thank you. Um, so you asked ideally and realistically, and I think what's important is finding a way to bridge those two, you know, and we all need the reality check right now. The reality is right now we are facing more restrictions and regulation. We're facing more pressure, more nimbyism, less power availability, less tax incentives. What do we do? I love the idea of renewable power generation. And last year I talked about going in as an industrial co-op, which I did do some research on the viability. And here's the thing, you can build renewable power generation. It takes 10 years to build the transmission lines to get it anywhere. Okay, that's not gonna cut it. What do we do? Okay. The reality is also that utilities will push back and not let you out from under them. Google, Switch, and somebody else actually tried this a few years ago. It took 83 million to get out from under the utility. We don't have that. So it's gonna take incredibly creative solutions, likely microgrid generation. And, you know, frankly, balancing the ideal side there, I like to look at it through the objectivism lens, where we're gonna face these regulatory hurdles. We're going to try to come up with creative solutions that are also profitable. Nothing's going to happen if we don't start telling the story. And, you know, this is bigger than any one of us. And the way I look at this, like, you know, engineering, we're great. We are so great at talking to each other on these kind of panels and at these types of conferences. But if we don't take it outside of these, if we are not spreading the word very, very, very publicly, we're just going to continue to face these pressures. This, this is so much bigger than just our moment and our connection. If, if we aren't going to utility conferences and begging and pleading to get on stage and talk to them about our needs, if we aren't going to public facing initiatives and also talking about these, in two years, I'm terrified what's going to happen. And so what I can say is absolutely keep up the good work with what we're trying to do sustainability-wise. Keep being curious about the creative solutions, but by all means, tell your story as widely and far as you can. Yeah. Yeah, this is on our watch, and we can't just watch. Bill, do you agree? I do. Um, I, I think two points I want to touch on. Uh, we've we've kind of danced around, or, or, and we've spoken about it directly as well, but... Right. One is that sustainability is in the midst of a massive pandemic hangover. And what do I mean by that? I mean, if you went to a conference pre-pandemic, regardless of whether it was a renewables conference or whether it was a data center conference, the only topic that you would hear, or the one that was, 
that was front of mind for everybody was sustainability. Yeah. And it was because there was an infinite supply of material, there was an infinite supply of money, it, interest rates were zero, you could build renewables, you could focus on sustainability, it was cheap. That all changed after the pandemic. The supply chain constraints have completely changed the paradigm of renewable gener generation and pricing and energy pricing in general. And sustainability has taken a back seat for a lot of these large organizations who are thought leaders in the space. And they are committed to the sustainability, just not now. And so I think two years from now, when things start to mellow out a little bit, power prices come down, you're gonna to start to see that sustainability is gonna take uh, a much more forward position in, in everything that we do in the data center space. Um, that's, that's one thing. The transmission question is, is another thing and it, there's no question about it. Privatized transmission companies, I don't know, maybe. Uh, I think right now what you're seeing is due to the scale of what's going on in the space, there is creative destruction. And we're gonna break this thing. I mean, it's almost broken right now. It's broken in a lot of places right now. Um, it, it, there will be a tipping point where everything has to change. There has to be different ways of contracting. There has to be different ways to be able to affect green tariffs. There has to be different ways to pay for transmission. We have a very balkanized system here in the US power grid, and that needs to change. Does it mean that it needs to be socialized somehow? I don't know, but something has to change with the transmission grid, because right now it can't keep up with the demands of a digital society. So I think that, and I think that has to happen in the next two years, and I think you'll see it. Jeff? I got nothing, <laughs> so again. But he no. says that, and then no, a couple of things. No, some some excellent points there. Um, just a quick metric: the, the, right now in the U.S., we need approximately 1,500 miles of new transmission lines to meet barely current demand. I'm not talking about the exponential GPU demand. Anyone know how many we built last year? 90. Right. So that's not going to work. One of the reasons I came to Bloom is, uh, to me, the short-term answer until we have. Well, clean energy zones, which I love, but I don't. if we keep this to a two-year window, I don't think that's gonna happen. So right. it's going to be on-site generation. If we can, again, be pragmatic and, and, and deploy something that is also green, excellent. To Bill's point, uh, switching over to ESG, when I was a developer and writing leases, say a couple of years ago, ESG was important. Even at an environmental company like Bloom, I never hear a tenant even hint at it. Mm -hmm. They just care, when can you get me the power? How quickly can you get me the power? I don't care. Right. I don't care. But it is, gonna, it is going to, to snap back, um, in, in my opinion, right? So in the minute and 46 seconds, I would summarize as I think short-term window, we're going to have a lot more on-site power generation. We're going, to, we're going to meet the demand because it's, the business is at stake and there's a lot of money at stake. Privatization, for instance, I don't think so. If we remember, why do utilities have government-sanctioned monopolies? It's so you don't have a million different wires going across your town from different companies, right? So uh, I don't think that's going to happen. It's, so it's going to be on-site until we, I think we will get to a, a green energy zone type of concept for 80% of the workloads. As we all know, some workloads are latency sensitive, so they're gonna have to be edge-based, but we can, we can get there with all of these ideas, actually. Thank you, mm -hmm. Rob. All right, uh, in 53, two, one I second. It was last, I no. apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mine is super simple, to be honest. Uh, so, to your prediction, um, so today most uh, builders, operators can, off the top of their mind, kind of give you an estimate of the cost to build a data center, right? You know, used to be used to be like on the low end, four or five dollars a watt. It's gone up a little bit since then, right, uh, with inflation. But you know, oh, eight dollars a watt, nine dollars a watt to build it. So in two years, we're gonna be able to do that with carbon, right? You're gonna build your data center and you're gonna say, hey, the amount of embodied carbon on day one is gonna be X amount of tons. 
and then over the uh, course of the lifetime, you'll be able to predict uh, the emissions from your data center very easily. So we're going to have the data available, crossing our fingers, and we'll be able to have those numbers at the tip of our tongues. Incredible job. Thank you. Thank you guys to this rock star lineup. We have Jeff Barber, Rob Bunger, Jay Lawrence, Brett Lindsay, Dean Nelson, Melissa Really Elliott, Bill Thomas. Join these fellow authors and all our authors here today, as well as our JSA and other sustainability-minded company thought leaders as we continue the celebration of our Greener Data Exchange right next door, immediately to my right on Orchard Terrace. Yes, for the next hour, we will be pouring greener martinis and signing books, sunshine and networking, as we toast to a future filled with greener data. Salute. <laughs>